Continuing here with um, question 15, is it possible for a subject to have a vital capacity with a normal range but a value for FEV1 below normal range? The classic answer for that is yes, and that would be asthma or anybody with obstructive lung disease. So that's classic for obstructive lung disease. Asthmatics tend to have their smaller airways narrowed by smooth muscle constriction, thickening of the walls, and mucus secretions. How would this affect the vital capacity? Well, does it affect vital capacity? Remember, they have normal vital capacity, so nope, does not affect vital capacity. So, uh, how about the FEV1? And yes, it does affect the FEV1. It will take longer for them to be able to breathe out and their vital capacity amount of air that they have in their lungs. So the FEV1 will be um, not what it should be. So they will be not able to breathe as much of their vital capacity out in within one second as a normal person would be able to. Bronchodilator drugs open up airways and clear mucus. How will this affect the FEV uh, measurement? Will it return it to normal? So it should. If you are clearing the mucus and you are dilating the airways, then that should mean that you are able to breathe out your vital capacity breath within the normal range. How would an asthmatic person's measurement of FEV1 compare to an athlete? Um, actually, there are athletes that have asthma. But, um, so again, an F the asthmatic person, the FEV1 is abnormally small. So they will not be able to breathe as much out of a vital capacity amount of air as a normal person. An athlete, they should be actually better than sort of better than average. Okay, the second part of the third part, I guess, of the um, of this lab is aerobic exercise physiology. And again, there are a lot of things that you, um, well, we can't really do, but you can exercise and sort of uh, measure your heart rate. Um, of course, it goes up when you're exercising. Your skin temperature is kind of interesting. Um, at first, um, it goes up and then it will go down as the sweating cools you down and you are evaporating air, um, sorry, water off of your skin. So then uh, the skin temperature goes down, the breathing rate goes up and the airflow goes up as you are exercising. These are all up, up, up by quite a bit. The heart rate also goes up. The skin temperature at first it goes up and then it goes down. So both ways. Um, during exercise, uh, you should measure your heart rate, breathing rate, and airflow. You can try that and uh, record that in your data table right here. And in post-exercise, your heart rate will slowly return to normal. The fitter you are, the faster it will return to normal. Your skin temperature also, everything will go back to normal um, pre-exercise, basically. So let's answer these questions. Um, hypotheses regarding the effect of exercise on heart rate, uh, respiratory rate, and skin temperature, you're supposed to list here. So if we exercise, our heart rate is going to go up. So we're going to hypothesize that. And our respiratory rate, so how many breaths per minute we're taking, also goes up. The skin temperature actually goes down after first going up, and then it goes down. When do you think the subject will start sweating during exercise or post-exercise? Well, depending on if you're exercising long enough, then if it's not just a minute or two, then you should be starting to sweat during exercise and you continue sweating a little bit post-exercise. Uh, using your data, describe the timing and types of physiological changes observed during exercise. So, well, when you're exercising, your heart rate goes up and um, the explanation for that is your sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system will increase uh, the heart rate. The breathing rate also goes up because you need to deliver more oxygen to the tissues, namely your muscle tissues, so your breathing rate goes up. Also your ventilation depth, uh, your tidal volume is going to increase and your ventilation depth is also increased. And well, the temperature is first going to go up and then it's going to go down, so it's going to go both ways. 
Um, you can try and see what, how long it will take for you to start sweating once you exercise. So it's probably a good idea. Everybody should get out and do some exercise. Otherwise, we're going to just uh, gain a lot of weight during our quarantine, and that's not so good. Um, the temperature changes before and after sweating commence. So before sweating, uh, you're going to divert a lot of blood into the skin, and that makes the skin feel hotter. Now, once the sweating is starting, that's when you have little water droplets or a certain amount of fluid that's building up on your skin. And as it evaporates off of your skin, it will take energy off of your skin because it takes energy to go from liquid to gas stage. And that energy comes from the skin. So you're taking it off of the surface of the skin. So you're, uh, after you start sweating, the temperature will go down and you will start feeling cooler. When exercising, does wiping off sweat help cool down the body? Well, obviously, since the the actual cooling effect comes from the water evaporating off of the surface of the skin, so if you're wiping off the sweat, no, that, that will not help to cool you down. And number 25, how long did it take before the subject's physiological measurements returned to resting levels? Well, that varies depending on your fitness level. The faster you return to normal, the fitter you are. And 26, what physiological mechanisms are operating during the post-exercise period? Well, the sympathetic side um, stops being so dominant and your parasympathetic side sort of bring you back to this rest and digest level. That's probably the most important thing. Um, define anaerobic threshold. That's the time when you are unable to deliver enough oxygen to the muscle tissue that needs it. And then they are forced it into an anaerobic metabolism because that's all you can do. If you don't have enough oxygen, then you can only do fermentation, and it's not really good. It's not efficient either, and it builds up lactic acid too. On 28, though, how does anaerobic threshold change with training? So as you're building um, more aerobic capacity, you're building more mitochondria, and uh, probably also more myoglobin, and you will be starting to have an anaerobic threshold so you you basically the training will shift your anaerobic threshold to where it will take you much longer to reach that anaerobic threshold if you ask a couch potato um, to do a big workout they're going to be really sore if somebody does a workout every day they won't be sore after that same workout so um it does change with training and you will get better at managing the anaerobic threshold and you will reach it much later than somebody that doesn't train. And then here we have uh, compare the changes in airflow, ventilation rates um, within subject, between subjects. So um, if you are exercising, your airflow will increase, of course, um, and we don't have any comparison data, so we might as well just say this is it. And um, for the quiz for next week, um, be sure that you are able to calculate alveolar versus pulmonary ventilation. Uh, you should also definitely take a look at my favorite equation, and that is CO2 plus H2O forms carbonic acid H2CO3 and that dissociates into hydrogen ions plus bicarbonate ions and this is the reason why when you're exhaling into water um, the water turns acidic and you should definitely take a look at that video clip that I found on the internet on YouTube um, I would have done a much better job in the in the lab demonstrating that but anyway I usually put a pH indicator in there and then once I'm inhaling or exhaling sorry into the water then the pH shifts very dramatically and so I have a pH indicator that is pink when it is above seven and it has no color when it's below seven and so I'm adding on purpose a few drops of sodium hydroxide and then the pH is definitely above seven so the um, solution is pink 
And then if you're just exhaling a single breath into that water, you will change the pH so to where the pH indicator loses its color and being, it looks completely like water. But behind all of this is the this equation right here. And you should take a look at the video clip. The guy is doing a pretty good job. He just didn't add a pH indicator, which is what I would have done. Other than that, I think you should be good. Be sure that you know the volumes, the capacities, you know this equation and um, uh, you know how to calculate pulmonary versus alveolar ventilation you should be fine